Christmas Eve, 1945, Fayetteville, West Virginia. George and Jenny Sauter are preparing to celebrate the holidays with nine of their children, but shortly after they go to bed, their home burns completely to the ground. When the smoke clears, five of the Sauter children are nowhere to be found, and a search of the rubble fails to turn up any trace of their remains. Due to a number of suspicious events surrounding the fire, the Sauters begin to suspect that their five missing children were kidnapped, and over 20 years later, they would receive a mysterious photo of a man whom they believe to be their now adult son. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and since Christmas is right around the corner, I will be presenting a special holiday-themed mystery today, the bizarre 1945 disappearance of the Sauter children. In case you're not familiar with it, this is a story of five children who vanished after their family home burned down on Christmas Eve, and the whole thing is a lot more complex than you'd expect. Other than the John Benet Ramsey case, this might be the most famous unsolved mystery which has ever taken place at Christmas time. I've already covered quite a few stories on this podcast which took place around the holidays, such as the Fort Worth 3 disappearance, the death of Rhonda Henson, and the Tommy Ziegler case, but this may be the strangest. Yes, I do tend to favor cases which aren't as well known and haven't been featured on other podcasts, but given that I have a major fascination with this case, and it's Christmas time, I'm willing to make an exception here. This mystery seems to be a particularly popular one among online sleuths, which is probably why it's garnered a lot of exposure and analysis on the internet this past decade. If you go to the Web Sleuths forum, you'll find pages and pages worth of discussion about the Sauter children because it is such a rabbit hole. I actually featured this case in the very first article I wrote for listverse.com, 10 Mysterious Disappearances of Multiple People, and it was also in one of my Halloween-themed articles at crack.com, 5 Creepy Unsolved Disappearances That Nobody Can Explain. Though admittedly, the entry on the Sauter children was penned by my co-writer, not myself. But before we get started, just a brief reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes like this one and 15-20 to minute mini-sodes about smaller scale cold cases. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new mini-sode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it and please leave us a rating or a review at any of these sites as that will help us garner more exposure. The Trail Went Cold has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who's feeling the holiday spirit and wants to make a generous donation, we would be very thankful for the Christmas gift, and we'll definitely give you a shout-out on a future episode. We actually just received a nice early Christmas donation from a listener named Alexander, so thank you very much for that, Alexander. So with that out of the way, let us now delve into one of the all-time strangest holiday mysteries. Our story begins in Fayetteville, West Virginia in 1945. Our central figures are George and Jenny Sauter, a pair of Italian immigrants who have been married over 23 years and have 10 children. I'll just quickly reel off their children's names from oldest to youngest. John, 23, Joe, 21, Marion, 17, George Jr., 16, Maurice, 14, Martha, 12, Louis, 9, Jenny, 8, Betty, 5, and Sylvia, 2. The Sauters seem to be living an ideal middle-class life, as George runs a successful trucking company which hauls coal throughout the region, and the entire family lives in a two-story timber frame house two miles outside of town. On Christmas Eve, the Sauter family is spending the evening at home, and the only one of the ten children who's absent is Joe, who is off serving in the army. Earlier that night, Marion surprised her siblings by bringing home new toys for them from her job at a local store, so the younger kids ask if they can stay up a little later than their usual bedtime. Given that it's Christmas Eve, their mother tells them it's okay, as long as they finish their chores. By this point, George and the oldest sons in the house, John and George Jr., are already asleep. After putting baby Sylvia down, Jenny goes to bed at around 10 p.m., and sadly, this would turn out to be the last time she ever saw half of her children. At around 12.30 a.m., Jenny was awakened when the phone rang, so she went downstairs to answer it. Jenny heard a woman's voice on the line whom she did not recognize, and this person asked for someone she didn't know. Jenny also heard the sound of laughter and clinking glasses in the background. When Jenny told the caller that she had the wrong number, the woman let out what she described as a weird laugh before hanging up. At this point, Jenny noticed that Marion was now sleeping on the couch, but the front door was unlocked, the curtains were open, and the lights were still on. The children were presumably now sleeping in the attic, but for whatever reason, they had forgotten to finish all their usual chores before going to bed, so Jenny closed the curtains and turned off the lights herself before returning to bed. She was soon awoken by a loud bang which sounded like an object hitting the roof and rolling down. Jenny dozed off again, but shortly thereafter, she woke up to the smell of smoke and noticed that the house was now on fire. She immediately woke up her husband, grabbed Sylvia from her crib, yelled up at her children in the attic, 
and then went downstairs to wake up Marion. John and George Jr. quickly exited the attic, and by this point, their hair was already singed. George, Jenny, John, George Jr., Marion, and Sylvia managed to exit the house, but the other five children, Maurice, Louis, Martha, Jenny, and Betty, never came out, and the stairway to the attic was blocked by flames. Since the phone in the house was surrounded by flames, Marion was forced to run to a neighbor's house in order to call the fire department. George planned to use a ladder to climb up to the attic window and rescue his children, but for whatever reason the ladder had disappeared from its usual spot and could not be found anywhere. He then planned to back up his two trucks to the house and use them to climb to the attic window, but neither of the trucks would start. So in the end, the Sauter family just could not reach the attic, and the entire house burned down and collapsed into the basement within 45 minutes. Being that it was Christmas Eve, and the fire department was already short-handed, they had an incredibly difficult time coordinating with each other. Believe it or not, one of the reasons for the delay was because the volunteer fire chief, F.J. Morris, didn't know how to drive the fire truck, so they did not even arrive at the scene until 8 a.m. Christmas morning. On the surface, this seemed like nothing more than a terrible tragedy where five children perished in a house fire, but there are reasons why this story is considered to be an unsolved mystery, as many suspicious things caused George and Jenny Sauter to suspect that something more sinister was at work here. For starters, it turned out that the phone line had been slashed. Initially, it was suspected that the fire might have burned through the line, but when a telephone repairman looked at it, he concluded that the line had been deliberately cut and that someone would have had to have climbed 14 feet up a pole in order to do so. The reason George could not find the ladder in order to climb up to the attic was because it was at the bottom of an embankment 75 feet away and no one knew how it got there. George also found it strange that neither of his trucks would start when he attempted to back them up to the house, as they had both worked fine the previous day. A block and tackle had also gone missing from the Sodder's garage, and neighbors would report that they'd seen a man stealing it. And at no point did anyone hear the five children calling for help from the attic or see them approach the window to attempt to escape. The Sodders would begin to wonder if their missing children had even been in the house when it went up in flames. Fire Chief Morris spent two hours searching the rubble on Christmas morning, and surprisingly, he told the family that he could find no bones or human remains at all. Nevertheless, Morris concluded that the fire probably burned so hot that it completely incinerated the children's bodies and left nothing behind. Now, there were plans for the state fire marshal's office to visit the site and perform a more thorough investigation, but after four days, they still hadn't shown up, and the Sodders were so grief-stricken that they could no longer bear looking at the remains of their home. So George decided to bulldoze over the site and cover the entire basement with dirt. The family eventually planted flowers there and turned the location into a memorial shrine for the children, which they would maintain for the next several decades. A coroner's inquest was held, and the ruling was that the cause of the fire was likely electrical and the result of faulty wiring. However, the Sodders had an issue with this ruling as they had recently had the house rewired and were assured by the electrical company that everything was safe. They also claimed their Christmas lights remained on for a while after the fire started, which they don't believe would have happened if the problem was electrical. If the Sodders' power had completely gone out, they don't believe that any of them would have made it out of the house alive. Evidence began surfacing to suggest that arson was involved. A bus driver would eventually come forward and claim that while driving through the area on Christmas Eve, he saw people throwing what appeared to be balls of fire at the Sodder house. When spring hit, a rubber ball-like object was found in the nearby brush which resembled a napalm bomb, a weapon which was frequently used by the military during World War II. Since Jenny had briefly been awakened by a thumping sound on the roof, it seemed possible that a napalm bomb was used to set the house afire. The Sodders also started conducting their own research, which made them think it would have been impossible to completely incinerate their children's bodies until there was nothing left. They spoke with an employee at a crematorium who said that even after burning a human body at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for two straight hours, there should still be bones remaining. Yet there were no bones found for five children killed in a house fire, which probably didn't reach the temperature of a crematorium. So if the Sodder children weren't actually killed in the fire, what could have possibly happened to them? Were they kidnapped? Well, believe it or not, there would be eyewitness accounts from people who claimed to have seen the children alive after the fire. One woman who went by the scene that night claimed she saw the children staring at the burning house from inside a car. Another woman claimed she served the children breakfast on Christmas morning at a nearby rest stop, while a car with Florida license plates was parked in the lot. In the weeks before the fire, John and George Jr. also remembered that they'd seen a strange car parked on the highway, and a man inside seemed to be watching the younger children as they headed home from school. While it seemed unbelievable that five children of various ages, the oldest of whom was 14, could be abducted simultaneously, there were just too many bizarre things going on to completely discount this possibility. In 1947, the Sodders hired a private investigator named C.C. C. Tinsley to look into the case, and he would learn something very odd about F.J. Morris, the fire chief who conducted the initial investigation of the scene and claimed there were no remains there. Tinsley started uncovering rumors that Morris had lied about not finding any remains, Apparently, he'd actually found a human heart and proceeded to put it inside a box before returning to bury it at the site. And this rumor picked up credibility when a local minister confirmed that Morris had shared this with them. So Tinsley and George Sauter confronted Morris about this, so he actually took them to the site and proceeded to dig up a metal dynamite box containing what appeared to be a human heart. It was subsequently turned over to a funeral director who said this so-called heart was actually beef liver and showed no signs of ever being exposed to fire, 
So what was the rationale for this? Well, I don't know if Morris himself ever officially confirmed this, but there were rumors that he told people that he'd taken some beef liver and buried it at the scene because he believed that if the Sodders ever found it there on their own, they'd finally accept that their children's remains were there and receive some closure. Okay, well, setting aside the questionable ethics of the whole thing, I don't quite understand Morris's logic here. If he wanted the Sodders to think that beef liver was the remains of one of their children who died in the fire, why would he put it inside a metal box? I just don't see how that's logistically possible. But whatever Morris's motivations were, this weirdness only made the Sodders more determined to prove their children survived that night. In August of 1949, George convinced a pathologist from Washington, D.C. to perform a more thorough excavation of the site, and they did find some bone fragments which turned out to be lumbar vertebrae. These remains were sent to the Smithsonian Institute for examination, and I'm going to quote their final report. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit of age should be about 22 since the centra, which normally fuse at 23, are still unfused. On this basis, the bones show greater skeleton maturation than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, the oldest missing solder child. It is however possible, although not probable, for a boy 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 17 maturation. So yes, the oldest of the missing solder children was Maurice, who was 14, so it seemed very unlikely that the vertebrae could have belonged to any of them, and the remains show no signs of ever being exposed to fire. It seemed likely they wound up at the site because they were in the dirt George had used to fill the basement, but how exactly did they wind up there? Apparently, C.C. Tinsley was able to trace these remains to a nearby cemetery, but I'm not quite sure how he was able to determine this. But given that the fire chief had already confessed to burying a beef liver at the site, the Sodders had good reason to be suspicious. Unfortunately, the current location of the vertebrae is unknown. Records show that the remains were returned to George, but no one knows what happened to them. If they could be found, DNA testing might be able to determine if they belonged to someone from the Sodder family. George and Jenny would go out of their way to keep the case in the spotlight. They erected a billboard on US Route 19 with photos of the five missing children, offering a reward and urging people to come forward with information. They tried to get the FBI to investigate their case as a kidnapping, and even got a response from J. Edgar Hoover himself. But since they could find no hard evidence that a kidnapping occurred, this never went anywhere. In 1952, shortly after the billboard went up, a woman who ran a hotel in Charleston came forward to say she'd seen four of the five children at her establishment one week after they disappeared. She said they were accompanied by two men and two women. When she tried to speak to the children, one of the men glared at her before turning around and speaking to everyone in Italian. After that, no one from the party would speak to her. George would spend the rest of his life chasing leads all over the country, but they often turned out to be dead ends. At one point, George read an article in a magazine about a ballet school in New York and saw a photo of a young dancer whom he believed to be his missing daughter Betty. He traveled to New York to see this girl, but her parents refused to let George see her, and he never did meet her. Another false lead occurred during the 1960s when George received a letter from a woman in Texas who claimed that a man she knew told her he was Louis Sauter after having too much to drink. While George went down there and actually met the man who supposedly confessed to being Louis and another man who was rumored to be Maurice, but they both confirmed they were not his missing children. But the most intriguing lead which convinced the Sauters their children were still alive occurred in 1968 when an envelope showed up in their mailbox which was postmarked from Central City, Kentucky. It contained a photograph of an unidentified man who appeared to be in his late 20s or early 30s, and the name Louis Sauter was written on the back. So yes, George and Jenny believed the man in the photo was their now grown-up son Louis, who was only 9 years old when they last saw him. There were some other things written on the back of the photo, including the phrases, I love brother Frankie, words which looked like a little boys, and what appeared to be A90132 or A90135. To this day, no one has ever figured out the meaning of these cryptic phrases or the identity of the man in the photo. Anyway, the Sodders hired another private investigator to travel to Central City, Kentucky to look into this, but he also vanished without a trace. Some people consider this to be an intriguing mystery within a mystery, but I personally think it's less mysterious, and more that he probably just took off with the Sodders' money. So let's just say these five children really were abducted. Who was responsible, and why would they target this particular family? Well, even though the Sodders were generally well regarded in the community, George was known for being very outspoken against Italian dictator Benito Mussolini and his fascist government. And since his son Joe was serving in the army during World War II, you can see why George would be so passionate about this subject. Given that Fayetteville had a large population of Italian immigrants at that time, not everyone in town agreed with George's views, so he did not shy away from getting into heated political arguments. Two months before the fire, the Sodders were visited at their home by an insurance salesman who tried to sell them policies for the children. When they turned them down, the salesman reportedly flipped out and told George that his house would go up in smoke and that his children would be destroyed over his quote-unquote dirty remarks against Mussolini. Of course, as the invention of the internet has proven, people make stupid threats against each other over political differences all the time, but the interesting thing here is that the same insurance salesman wound up being on the coroner's inquest jury when they ruled that the fire was accidental and caused by faulty wiring, so make of that what you will. 
Anyway, George Sauter died in 1969, but while his wife continued to keep the case alive, Jenny herself passed away 20 years later, and shortly thereafter, the billboard on US Route 19 was taken down. The surviving Sauter children did their best to keep the case in the spotlight, and most of them shared their parents' belief that their siblings did not die in the fire and were abducted. As time went on, they also passed away, and the only child who is still alive today is the youngest one, Sylvia, who is currently 73 years old. She still occasionally does interviews and continues to publicize her family's tragic story, but there really haven't been any new developments in this case for a long, long time. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. Well, I think it's easy to see why this has become one of the more popular cases for discussion among online sleuths. On the surface, this seems like one of the most baffling mysteries of all time, but given that it's over 70 years old, I think some of the more mysterious elements have been greatly exaggerated by the passage of time, and there are perfectly logical explanations for some of the stranger stuff. Just as an example, there's the weird phone call Jenny Sauter received shortly before the fire started with the woman laughing in the background. This sounds pretty ominous, but while researching this case for a segment on National Public Radio in 2005, the host, Stacy Horn, she discovered that the police actually tracked down the woman who made the call and discovered it was nothing more than a wrong number, which she presumably dialed while drinking at a Christmas party. It's just a strange coincidence that it happened on this particular night, but this is one of those details which has been blown out of proportion. In fact, if you look up Stacey Horn's blog about this, you'll learn that there was a lot of stuff cut from the NPR segment which helps shed some light on things, though there are still quite a few elements of this case which cannot be adequately explained. But I'm just going to say this up front. I really don't think the five Sauter children made it out of the house alive that night. There are enough odd details that you can initially believe that maybe someone kidnapped them, but once you break everything down, an abduction scenario just doesn't make any sense. The biggest problem is that the five missing children were all sleeping in the attic that night. From what I can tell about the layout of this attic, John and George Jr., the two surviving sons who went to bed early that night, slept in a different room than the other five children, which was separated by the attic stairway. So if there was an abduction, intruders would have had to enter the house, climb into the attic, abduct five children, the oldest of whom were 14 and 12 and easily capable of fighting back, and then somehow sneak them all out of the house without making enough noise to wake up anybody else. It just doesn't seem possible. Now to be fair, we technically cannot be 100% sure that the children even went into the attic that night. Remember, when Jenny was awakened by the phone call, she noticed that Marion was sleeping on the couch and that the lights were left on, the curtains were left open, and the door was locked. And Jenny found it pretty strange that all the kids would go to bed without finishing their chores like that. So maybe the five children had already been kidnapped by this point, possibly after someone lured them out of the house. However, the biggest hole in that theory is Marion. If you're planning a kidnapping operation, why would you leave behind the one child who is literally sleeping just a few feet away from the front door? And if her five siblings were being abducted, it just doesn't seem likely that Marion could have remained sleeping the entire time without hearing anything. Not to mention, how would you even smuggle five children out of the area? You'd need to have multiple people involved in the abduction, and it would be impossible to fit all these children and their abductors into one vehicle, so this would have had to be a very large coordinated operation which you'd think would have drawn a lot more attention. But even if a kidnapping did take place, then I can't fathom why none of these kids would have contacted their family. This isn't some case of an infant being kidnapped and not having any memory of their former life. The ages of these kids ranged from 5 to 14. One explanation is that they were all threatened by their captors and told the rest of their family would be harmed if they ever tried to get in touch with them. But fast forward 20 years and the Sauters receive a photo of an adult male who they believe was their son Lewis. If the man in the photo was actually Lewis, then that would mean he was allowed to live into his 20s or 30s, and by that point, I just don't see why he wouldn't contact his parents. I guess it's possible that all the kids could have been kidnapped and murdered at another location shortly thereafter, but what exactly would be the motive to kidnap half the kids from one family, leave the rest of them behind, and then set fire to their house? Well, one of the most popular theories is that the children were kidnapped by the Sicilian Mafia, who wanted to use them to extort money from George. This is the theory that most of the surviving Sauter siblings continued to believe long after their parents' death. Many online sleuths have noticed that the number written on the back of the photo of the young man resembling Lewis, which is either 90132 or 90135, they both happen to be zip codes in Palermo, the capital of Sicily. So maybe this was a clue that the Sicilian Mafia had abducted the children and taken them all the way to Italy. Another theory is that since George still had relatives in Italy, maybe rogue members of his family decided to kidnap the children and take them back to their father's homeland to start a new life. But none of these scenarios really make much sense. I know we had some eyewitness sightings of the children after the fire, but none of these people knew them personally, and eyewitness identification can often be unreliable. Either these witnesses were lying, or they just saw some children who resembled the Sodders and mistakenly thought it was them. And the mysterious photo of Lewis that the Sodders received in 1968 came only a few months after an article was published about the case in a magazine, so it very well could have been a cruel hoax. But I will admit that the photo has an extra level of intrigue because of the cryptic writing on the back. Why would a prankster bother to write, I love brother Frankie, when Lewis never had a brother named Frankie? And if those numbers weren't a zip code in Sicily, then what did they actually mean? It could just be a coincidence, but I'd be curious to know if the theory that the children were kidnapped by the Sicilian Mafia was public knowledge at the time. 
If so, maybe some hoaxer decided to go to the trouble of digging up an Italian zip code just to mess with the Sodders. But even though the man in the photo probably isn't Lewis, I can't discount the possibility that someone might have been trying to send the Sodders some sort of message. Of course, the biggest obstacle to believing the five children died in the fire is the fact that none of their remains were found in the wreckage. But after 70 years of hindsight, it just seems more and more likely that you can chalk all that up to a faulty investigation. These days, whenever a fire expert is asked about this case, virtually all of them will point out that pretty much everything which can be done wrong while investigating a fire was done wrong during the initial investigation. Remember, we're talking about a very short-handed volunteer fire department who had a lot of trouble getting themselves organized and did not even show up to the scene until seven hours after the fire started. This department probably did not have a lot of experience investigating a fire this size, and they only went over the scene for about two hours before concluding there were no remains there. And then before a more thorough investigation could be performed, George Sodder dumps all this dirt into the basement and turns it into a memorial site, though it's hard to blame him considering that he's a grieving father who thinks he's lost five of his children there. So even though a more professional excavation was performed at the site years later, the scene was already seriously compromised. Now in many online discussions about this case, one point which is frequently brought up is the fact that West Virginia was one of the most prominent areas for coal mining, particularly during this time period. George's trucking business involved the hauling of coal, and he had a large supply of it inside his house, which was used to heat the place. And coal burns really, really hot. Even though the family was told that human bones were strong enough to survive the heat of a crematorium, it is possible that the combination of a house fire and a large supply of coal could produce enough heat to burn five children without fully developed bones until there was nothing left. But I'm not sure this type of thing would have been taken into account back in 1945, especially with such a poor investigation from the fire department. The house technically burned down and collapsed in only 45 minutes, but the fire continued to simmer for seven straight hours, plenty of time to reduce the children's remains to nothing if the heat was intense enough. It's also worth noting that when Stacy Horn was doing research for the National Public Radio segment, she discovered that the state fire marshal did interview everyone who was on the site that morning, and at least four witnesses claimed they saw remains there at some point, but didn't say anything. It's rumored that Chief Morris might have found these remains during his search, and chose to conceal them from the family for whatever reason. I mean, this is the same guy who decided to put beef liver in a box and bury it at the scene, so I wouldn't put anything past him. And we also have those vertebrae which showed up there that probably didn't belong to any of the children. I can't account for all these strange things. But in the end, we're talking about a half-assed investigation by an unprepared fire department in rural West Virginia in 1945, so it's not completely unfathomable that the children's remains could have been there all along without being recovered, or they were just destroyed entirely. I think the biggest wild card in this story is the oldest solder child, John. While George, Jenny, and most of the surviving children have always pushed forward the theory that the five children were abducted, John is the one member of the family who believed they died in the fire and wanted everyone to move on with their lives. And there might be a reason for that. You see, in the original police reports, John says in his initial interview that after the fire started, he ran into his siblings' room to wake them up and alert them about what was happening before exiting the attic. However, he later changed his story and claimed he only called out to his siblings and never actually saw them before he left. And this is a pretty important detail, because if John actually saw the five children in the attic after the fire started, then this completely negates the possibility of them being kidnapped. The rest of the family always tried to explain John's changing story by saying he had survivor's guilt. They believed he initially claimed he ran in to wake up his siblings because that's what he wished he would have done, but that his second story was the actual truth. But I don't know, I think the survivor's guilt explanation could apply in the other direction. If John actually saw his siblings, he might have regretted not doing more, such as physically pulling them out of their beds and helping them escape. By this point, the fire had spread pretty badly as John and George Jr.'s hair was singed when they left the attic. It's possible the five children had already succumbed to smoke inhalation, which is why they never climbed out of their beds or attempted to escape the attic. This would explain why no one heard them calling for help or saw them approach the attic windows when George attempted to rescue them. If that's the case, then there wouldn't have been anything John could do to save his siblings, but he was probably still plagued by the feeling that he had left them behind. That would be a tough thing to live with, which might account for why John changed his story and claimed he never actually saw the children while refusing to adhere to his family's belief that they were kidnapped. Since John has passed away, he took the real truth about what happened to his grave, but I think there's a good chance he's always been the key to this mystery. So overall, I think the most likely explanation is that the five children died in the fire that night. The whole thing was an unfathomable tragedy, and I think that George and Jenny Sodder were victimized by a terrible investigation, eyewitnesses who were mistaken about seeing their children alive, and people who attempted to exploit their grief. Because of this, they lived the rest of their lives believing their children might have been kidnapped. Unfortunately, they were forced to go off on some wild goose chases and never achieved full closure. All that being said, even if the simplest explanation is the correct one, and the children simply perished in the fire, I believe this is still an unsolved mystery. I have a hard time believing this was an electrical fire caused by faulty wiring, as there were just too many suspicious things for it to have been a mere accident. It really does seem like arson to me, and the Sodders still had good reason to pursue justice because someone probably got away with the murder of five children. And now I'm going to talk about the most frustrating aspect of this story. Remember how I mentioned that witnesses saw a man stealing a block and tackle from the Sodders' garage on the night of the fire? Well, according to police records, they actually tracked down this man and arrested him. He confessed to stealing the block and tackle, 
and admitted that he was the one who cut the solder's phone line, but denied starting the fire. For whatever reason, he claimed that he only cut the phone line by mistake because he thought it was the power line. Um, okay, then why exactly was he trying to cut the power line in the first place? Well, believe it or not, it seems that all that happened with this guy is that he paid a fine for the theft, and the police let him go. Even worse, his name has never been released publicly, and I'm not sure it's even listed anywhere on the official records. But my god, surely the police didn't just buy a story that he stole a block and tackle, mistakenly cut the solder's phone line for no real reason, and by sheer coincidence an unrelated fire burned their house to the ground on the exact same night. Now, block and tackles are often used for removing engines, and you'll recall that George claimed that neither of his trucks would start when he attempted to back them up to the house. You could easily deduce that this man might have tampered with the trucks, but unfortunately, I've never been able to find out if George actually found any signs of sabotage. For all we know, both trucks could have actually started working fine again after that night. A few years ago, Sylvia Sauter's husband was interviewed, and he expressed his belief that George and his sons might have been so anxious to get the truck started that they accidentally flooded the engines. And given that this was a really cold night, this explanation does make sense to me. But a lot of the other strange stuff that happened that night is not so explainable. The discovery of the ladder down the embankment 75 feet away is the strongest evidence that someone else was there and caused the fire. It seems likely it wound up there because the suspicious man used it to climb the pole and cut the phone lines. I might be willing to believe he had nothing to do with the fire and just decided to exploit the situation by stealing something, but if theft was his only motive, there's really zero reason for him to cut the phone or the power lines. It was the middle of the night, so he could have just stolen the block and tackle without cutting anything, and no one would have been the wiser. I might actually have an easier time accepting the initial explanation that the fire burned through the phone lines if this guy hadn't admitted to cutting them. But if he was involved, it doesn't sound like he acted alone. We also have an eyewitness who claimed they saw balls of fire being thrown at the house that night. All the sources say he saw people doing this, but none of them specify how many persons he actually saw. But assuming this eyewitness account is accurate, these balls of fire would coincide with Jenny Sauter's story of hearing a loud thumping sound on the roof, and the eventual discovery of an object at the scene which resembled a napalm bomb. But if one or more persons were deliberately attempting to burn down the Sauter house, then who were they, and why would they do this? Well, I really have my doubts that the Sicilian Mafia had anything to do with this, and the only thing that really connects the Mafia to the Sauters at all is that they're both Italian. I see no indication that the family ever crossed paths with the Mafia, and in spite of the attempted extortion theory, I see no reason for them to perpetuate something like this. But we do have that suspicious life insurance salesman who told George that his house would go up in smoke and that his children would be destroyed before he wound up on the same coroner's inquest jury which ruled the fire was an accident. I don't know if we can just chalk that up to coincidence or if there's some sort of nefarious conspiracy here, but this guy did imply that George was going to face retribution for his strong views against Benito Mussolini. I'm not sure if there was any seriousness to this threat, but George's outspokenness against Mussolini and his fascist government does seem like the only semblance of a motive for what happened. Like I said earlier, the Sauters were a hard-working, respected, well-liked middle-class family, and it seems like the only time they ever got on anyone's bad side is when George got into heated arguments about Mussolini. So this could have made him a target of some other Italian immigrants in the community who had pro-Mussolini, pro-fascist views, or it's possible that some American-born residents decided to attack an Italian immigrant family since Italy was the enemy during World War II. It wasn't uncommon for immigrants who were of the same nationality as America's opposition to be victimized by prejudice during the war. True, the war was over, and Mussolini had been dead for eight months at that point, but prejudice knows no bounds, and maybe someone who lost a loved one during the war decided to take out their rage on the Sodders. It actually would have been very helpful to know the nationality of the man who stole the block and tackle, and if he was an Italian immigrant or not. If this guy helped start the fire, then his nationality might shed some light on what the motive could have been. I don't want to go screaming conspiracy here, but I do wonder if some prominent residents in the area might have been involved in the fire, and there was an attempt to protect them. You could easily write Fire Chief Morris's actions off as incompetence, but I won't discount the possibility that he conducted a half-assed investigation in order to conceal evidence, close the case very quickly, and get it ruled an accident. Since the Sodders refused to let the case die, this might explain why Morris decided to bury the beef liver at the scene. Hell, maybe this also compelled someone to steal some remains from a cemetery and plant them there as well. I really don't know the full truth about what happened here, but anyway you slice it, the surviving members of the Sodder family, particularly the parents, George and Jenny, they got a very raw deal. If by chance this was nothing more than a tragic accident and there was no mystery to solve, then they were failed in a big way by people who helped give them the false impression that their children were still alive. I do think it's unlikely that Louis, Maurice, Martha, Jenny, and Betty Sauter survived that night. But even so, there should have been a much more thorough investigation into how that fire started, because there's a strong possibility that someone out there got away with the murder of five children. So that brings an end to this year's Christmas-themed episode. It is a very sad and tragic story, but I think this is a mystery which will live on forever. The idea of five children just vanishing from their home on Christmas Eve is so horrifying and baffling that you can't help but get sucked into the rabbit hole, even though it's likely the solution isn't as mysterious as it's made out to be. I know that 71 years have passed and there's probably zero chance this case can ever be solved, but the surviving Sauter sibling, Sylvia, is still doing interviews and keeping this case in the spotlight, so the family definitely still wants closure, 
If by chance you do happen to have any hard information which might uncover the full truth about what happened that night, or close the books for good on the fate of the five missing solder children, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own personal theory about this, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, especially those from the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. A big thank you to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me. And of course, a major shout out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website. So if you're feeling generous and want to leave us an early Christmas gift for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So I want to wish everyone out there a very safe and happy holidays. It's been nine months since we started this podcast, and we feel extremely thankful for the wonderful fan base we've built this year. We hope you all return again next time for a brand new mini-sode of The Trail Went Cold. Yeah.